Kaze, Tsakaze, Skaze. My name is Shaylin Sampson. I come from the Gixan Nation from Wilpsbuch um, and the Lachibu, which is the Wolf Clan. Um, my father is Richard Sampson from Gitmax. My grandmother was the late Aspayua, Patricia Sampson. And my grandfather was the late um, Hanadam, Abel Sampson. And my mother is Lynn Wilson. And my grandfather is uh, Chief Wo. Um, Wilfred Wilson, and my grandmother is Nancy Wilson, and I grew up in Hegelgat. Violet Gattensby. Hello, my name is Violet Gattensby. I'm from Carcross, Yukon, originally known as Caribou Crossing. That's where the caribou used to cross. Um, I come from a big family. I have nine, or eight sisters and four brothers, and my parents are Harold Gattensby, and Colleen James. Cedar. Yeah. Uh Skluz Teet Star to Slayota. Skluz Teet Star to Flaylup. Heich KCM. Speedy Dot Patchyaki. My name is Cedar George Parker. I'm from the Tsleilta Nation, Tlaylup tribe, from Yaki Apache. Uh, and I'm proud. I'm proud. I'm very, 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 very proud. And um I'm proud to be here. I want to thank you, thank the people of the land here. I want to raise my hands up for the good food taking care of us. I want to raise my hand to everybody here, all the organizers, and just acknowledge that I'm very thankful. Right, hike following. I have a good feeling in my heart, and I'm gonna let my people know back home about what happened here. Thank you. My John, man from Kasaid. Kasaid, yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Majin Man. I am here on behalf of Kalsa Aid today. I come from Vancouver, and my parents um, have migrated from Punjab, India, um, many, many years ago. So I'd like to thank all of you for allowing me to step into your territory and land to speak here and be a part of your culture today. Thank you. Um, maybe we'll start with uh, Shailen. Um, if you could just explain what brought you here and any other messages that you would like us to hear. Yeah, um, I think maybe I'll just start in, in where I began organizing. Um, I grew up in Hegelgut and then I went to school in um, Victoria on the Klungan territory. While I was there, I got really involved in student organizing and eventually um, was part of the organizing team that was at the legislature of, or at the occupation of the legislature in 2020 in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en after they had um, experienced their second raid. And so there were indigenous youth from over 40 different nations that were on the steps of the legislature throughout the time. It was a 17 day cumulative occupation. Um, and I feel like it was really, really amazing to see so many indigenous youth coming out from all over. I remember at the time it was commonly said that a win for the Wet'suwet'en is a win for us all. Um, there were so many people coming over and, and recognizing that the violation of human rights that was happening on Wet'suwet'en territory was gonna impact all of us. And the way that the government um, and industry was pushing through this project had real possibility ha to continue happening on any of our territories, especially for me as a young Gixan person, it felt incredibly important to be there and uphold this ancient alliance that has existed between the Gixan and Wet'suwet'en since before colonization. Um, I was one of five indigenous youth that were arrested at the legislature um, in March of 2020 in solidarity. Um, after that, I decided that I was gonna move home for the summer and I was gonna go and stay on the Yinta at the Gidimden checkpoint. Um, I was actually only supposed to be there for about a week and that was about three and a half years ago now. <laughs> so um, I've been living on the front lines or between here and Smithers and um, the front line at 44, which is the Gidim Den checkpoint um, that was established in 2019 or in 2018 um, before the first raids. Uh, I've been living there for the last three and a half years. Um, and yeah, there's there's been a lot that's happened on the territory in that time. I feel like I've been able to grow a lot as a person and understand my politics a lot more um, and connect with a lot of people from a lot of different political backgrounds. Um, that I think has strengthened my point of view um, and really empowered me as a young indigenous person. I've been really, really honored the last few years to be mentored by Slato um, and to, to live on her territory and live with her and her family. 
And I think that there's a lot of young indigenous people that are, are seeing this route of grassroots frontline direct action as a really viable way of getting the attention of the government, of industry and funders and pushing back and recognizing that when indigenous people say no on their territory, it means no. Um, in 2020, we saw nations from all over Canada, from all around the world, standing in solidarity in a way that really scared the Canadian state, that really hit them where it hurts in their wallets. And, it, and this moment of connection between these nations from all over um, we're stronger together, and the Canadian state knows that, and it's a real threat to them. Um, so I think that being involved in that and then being able to come back to the territory and be on the territory of my family um, was really, really empowering. Um, and, you know, the Gixan and Witsuten, we have this ancient alliance, and our, our feasting system is so similar that I got to learn a lot more about my culture and my history. Um, I lived at 44, which is at... Telkaikwa, which is the lamprey, is, which is lamprey Creek, um, where the Gixan used to come to Wet'suwet'en territory and harvest lamprey eels um, and eat them together. And so it seemed like a really significant place for me to be able to be grounded the last few years. Um, I was at Coyote Camp, um, which was an, a blockade established at the drill pad site um, in September of 2021. Um, and it was a 56 day occupation of that site and eventually a full closure of the road to the Yinta um, where the coastal gasoline pipeline is being constructed. And it was just like this amazing moment of power that I felt to be on that territory and to be able to be free of industry, free of police harassment. Um, I spent the last three and a half years being harassed and followed and arrested and it, um, you know, taken by the police. Um, and so it feels like really major to have been there during that time when we were just free of all of that. Um, and there was like five days where the police just couldn't get in at all to the entire territory. And it was really amazing to be a part of. Um, the raid that happened in November of 2020, there were, I think, 20 arrests that happened in those, or 30 arrests that happened in, over, in about two days um, on the territory. 32 arrests that have been on the territory over two days, um, in addition to the, the two raids that had already happened prior to that. Um, and I was one of those people arrested at Coyote Camp in the tiny house with Slado. Um, so coming out of that, I've, I've had a lot of experience um, just dealing with police repression, state repression. I'm aware of like the tactics that they're using to drive people apart. Um, I think that there's a lot of work that's being done by settlers that also come and support our nations. Um, and, and those divides are also being made bigger by media propaganda, cop propaganda. Um, and I think that we need to recognize that sticking together through these times of hardship um, and being dedicated to direct action in ways that is like gonna be effective against industry, against the police and against the state need to be upheld and recognized. I see a lot of young people that are coming to the table and recognizing that from the get-go now. Um, and I feel really lucky to be coming up in a generation of youth that are willing to take those risks even further. Um, that's built on what our ancestors and our elders have done for us. Like I think there's a step that we're willing to take as young people now um, that's more direct and standing up directly to the violence that the state is putting on us. Um, Anyway, I feel like I've been talking for a while, so I'll hand it off, but thanks. Next, we'd like to hear from Violet. Um, so Car Cross Yukon, uh, Caribou Crossing, I'm gonna tell you a bit about what my grandmother told me about the area and the history of it. So Car Cross Yukon, was originally known as Caribou Crossing. It was changed by the bishop in the residential school because he was receiving mail for Caribou Crossing, BC, and he no longer wanted mail getting mixed up, so he took it upon himself to change it to uh, Car Cross Yukon. So I'm originally from Caribou Crossing, and there used to be so many caribous that went through that it looked like ant hills. Those are only in our stories. 
we don't get caribou numbers like that anymore. Our people have taken it upon ourselves to um, reduce eating caribou and hunting them for years. And at this point, my generation, we don't have knowledge on hunting anymore, not caribou. We wouldn't know where to find them. We wouldn't know um, what to do, any of that. And there's also stories of my grandma when she was a young child, she would sail to, um, she would sail to Marsh Lake. So Marsh Lake is the southern lakes in the Yukon, and it's 3,000 kilometers inland from the ocean. Um, and those salmon travel 3,000 kilometers to Marsh Lake. And when they hit Marsh Lake, the wind blows differently. And when that wind blows differently, my grandma said they knew to sail over to where the fish were. That's how they knew they were coming in. So when they would sail there, they would sing, eat ha, when they paddled on the water there. They would sing the salmon into them. Um, and so those two, those are only stories. Last year, we had a count of 13 salmon that made it over the dam. I don't have any knowledge of salmon. I have to go to other villages and other nations um, to trade for salmon, trade for caribou. My people do. The only thing we have left of salmon and caribou is in our stories. So I'm here today to listen and learn, to see what I can do to hopefully call them back. Because in the year's time that I've told you guys this story, I said, or last time I was down here, I told you this story. And since then, I'd like to say that my mother has pulled out a salmon out of her net. It hasn't happened in 60 years, and she pulled a salmon out of her net. And she wanted me to come down here and tell you guys that story. So that's why I'm here. Thank you, Violet. Um, let's go to Majan Man. And I actually would, before I get into why I'm here to speak up here, I would like to thank all of you. I've been hearing a lot of thank yous coming my way, our way, um, as the guests. But thank you for letting us be a part of this event, being a part of your sacred culture, being able to experience it firsthand, and being able to experience how giving Indigenous people and culture are, are truly. I think I, I was reading one day um, uh, on, the, on, on the web how, how someone, what someone says to you will not stick, but how, some, but how someone makes you feel will remain for a very, very long time. And I think the gratitude and love and humility I felt from the, peop from the indigenous people has, has been beyond what I ever imagined and expected. So thank you. And so before I get on to what I'd like to say, I, do, I would like to disclaim that the views I share here today are, are my own and do not represent any of the affiliates or organizations um, uh, that I work with. My name is Mujin. I come, I volunteer with Khalsa Aid Canada, which is an international NGO that Bal spoke to yesterday, um, where we provide humanitarian and disaster relief support to victims of natural and man-made disasters. I joined Khalsa Aid after finishing university and trying to find what initiatives I could be a part of to give back to the community. Giving back, giving back is a concept that is very sacred in Sikhi, something we hold very deeply and are guided by our gurus. In Sikhi, our holy guru, we hold utmost respect for nature and all its beings and how we all must be one and together with everything around us. I would like to pull up a specific um, hymn from Gurbani. Pavan Guru Pani Pita Mata Tatamahat. Air is our Guru, water is our father, and earth is the great mother of all. 
And so a lot of the conversations I've been hearing the past few days, it's, it's very enlightening, but it also hits very close to home. And as it sounds, all sounds very similar. I think yesterday I was hearing, you know, we need to understand the relationship between us and nature and how we must not just take, we must also give back. And so at Khalsa Aid, we look to give back. We look to give back to the communities we come from. We look to give back to those in need. As part of my transition to Vancouver and doing Seva here, our team took on various projects um, to support homeless and provide support to inter international students through temporary accommodations, food pack, as well as educating the international youth on, on their rights that they have within the colonial law, at least. I was asked to speak um, to some of the struggles that our community, the Punjabi community, has faced. And before I speak to the struggles, I'd like to sort of first go back to why they exist in the first place. And the reasons my parents migrated 25 plus years ago, and the reasons why international students continue to migrate to North America is because somewhere we've given up. We've given up on our fight. We've given up on if there's someone listening. We've given up on if there's hope and, and our voices are being heard. And speaking to some of the struggles of the Punjabi and Sikh community, trying to intertwine our culture with the culture here, trying to build a connection with the community, not having the parental connections, but because our parents are busy working 12 hours a day to give back to us, lacking the guidance in terms of education, where we need to be educated to know what our rights are. And this ties into, I think, very closely to what the indigenous community has, has felt and has been put into, whether it be through residential schools, erasing your identity, erasing your cultural belongings, where you come from. And I think when communities go through this sense of Culture sync cultural syncretization, what happens is you lose your sense of identity when you're trying to pull too many strings or, or hold on to too many strings. And, and that leads to not knowing, uh, not having a sense of self. And that ties into very, very closely being f the feeling of being lost, the feeling of not knowing where you come from, and then tying that into emotional vulnerability, mental health, mental illnesses, and eventually drug abuse and overuse. And I think what my, I've learned is that two things that is important for the youth going forward and that I see very strongly here um, from our speakers and those in the audience, one, is to hold strong to your values. That does not come easy, especially given how influential social media is today and what is being put out there. And so look internally to yourself to look for, the, to look for that strength, to hold to your values, to hold, hold to your culture, regardless of what is happening around you. And two, the importance of ed education, being well educated learning from your ancestors, learning from your chiefs, learning from others around you, the history, the tactics, the, the play that Kai s pre presented yesterday, what they've, what's been done and how it's continued to being used and deployed today. Learning, learning, from, learning from their law, their system, where they are not operating within their law. And so I think the way I'd like to tie it back today is back to the basics of Sikhi and Khalsa Aid. Being one, recognizing all of us as one with each other, with nature, and together protecting our air, water, and earth. Thank you. Thank you. Cedar George. <clears throat> I'm here for the good food. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, uh, I was low key thinking like, uh, yeah, why am I here? And so I, I can't say that without a little bit of history of my my family. So the farthest back we hit the Spaniards down in uh, Mexico. The the Spaniards came and they 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 went right through with their armor. We never seen a horse, but we're the first ones to see horses. And uh, I was like, what the hell? And they're wearing this armor. What the heck? It was like aliens. Like if we saw aliens come here, how are we gonna fight these aliens? We fought them, and you know, I'm, I'm I'm happy to say there's hundreds of thousands of native speakers that speak our language. You know, we 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 persevered, and um, and so the Spaniards came through, and you know, killed, raped, and 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 put churches on top of our temples. They put churches on top of our of our pyramids. And so what what happened is they got to my village and the uh, and the uncles came and said hell no and they, and they they snuck in you know we could be a little sneaky, <laughs> and so we we went right in there and, and 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 killed them, we killed the officers but then we okay it's time to migrate you know we followed the eagle, and the snake, on a cactus down here maybe it's time to go back up, so we went back up and we stopped around present day Texas. And our Apache, and so you know, it's a it's a it's a story of crazy stuff. There's a lot of love in this story, <laughs> a lot of love, and that's what it comes down to. It comes down to that, and um, you know, so we stopped there and we started to have the babies with each other, right? It was it was beautiful, you know. They 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 took us in, and so by the time the Spaniards came up there, the horses migrated faster, so we mastered the horses better than the white man. <laughs> And so we were able to, the horses came from Mexico and migrated north. And by the time they got to Apache territory, we were able to ride the horses. But we knew the land too, and so we were able to fight them off. And so on our Apache side, we fought the Spaniards, we fought the U.S., the Texas, the Mexicans, and the French. And we're still here. You know, we're still here fighting. And then, um, then the Yaqui territory was over there, and so they decided to have more babies. <laughs> And you know, it's a love story too. And then so, you know, let's skip a few generations later down to Tulalip, Washington, where my mother is from. And they, they had a policy to get Indians from the reservation into the cities to learn to be assimilated or either get educated with the white man, but it backfired because the Indians just found each other. <laughs> the Native Americans found each other. <laughs> and guess what? Guess the, what's the, what do you think happened here? My grandpa came down to modern day Texas before it was Mexico, before that it was well, it's still Apache territory and always will be. And then they came down there and uh, my grandma pulled over in, in her in her car and uh, said, who's this good looking guy? <laughs> and then pulled over and said, get in. And my grandpa started walking to get in the car and she just and just goes off and just like leaves them there. But then they met and, and they got, <laughs> yeah, then they met later. But then guess what? Uh, guess what they did? They had babies, <laughs> and and then they came back up to Washington. And then my mother, you know, my my mother, um, my mom. Then they had my mom, right? And then my mom decided she needed to go up to Vancouver. She needed to get out. And my mom and dad met at a really spiritual spot. Uh, they met at the club. <laughs> and guess what they did? <laughs> guess what happened? <laughs> they had me. They had babies. <laughs> And 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 you know what though we all came together, we always came together. They they all came together to keep on, you know, to keep this history alive. There's nothing really special about me and the work that I do. I'm doing the same thing that my ancestors did, and I'm not going to be the last generation to stop. You know why? Why am I here? Also, is uh, you 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 know, there's always hard times. There's always hard times, but our culture and our spirituality got us through it. Our system of working got us through it. Our system of education and how we raise the children in the longhouse or in the fire ceremonies. We have fire ceremonies in Mexico and the little fires, sometimes big, and flowers with a lot of flowers, a lot of copal, very, very smell. smells really good. And and so, so, so yeah, I ended up, I, I remember growing up in the longhouse, and, and, and no matter how much we were in poverty, even if we had food stamps, my parents would always give it all to the longhouse. We had those cheap cheeses, and then we had flour. We were able to get flour, milk, and cheese, and then we were able to share that with the longhouse. But my, but it, it was our system and ec our our system of working when it comes to economy that we knew that we take care of each other. We know we're going to be taken care of, and we do that for the babies, not just the animal, not just the human babies, but the grass. You know, the elders say, "I want to speak." 
not to the people, but I want the grass to hear me again. I want the trees to hear me. I want my children. And it's going to come back, and it's coming back where we go to the mountains until, and we sit with a plant until it speaks to us. And that's what we call Heichkwalowin. And that's why we fight. And we implement that Heichkwalowin, that good feeling of the mind and heart, and we implement that into our children. And that's our education system in the longhouse. That's our education system. That's what we do. And, 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 and even when we go through hard things, uh, we, we know we have a place to let go and add. You know, like, um, I've seen the bad stuff. Yeah, I went to a little bit of business school. I, I started, <laughs> right? <laughs> I didn't even mean to be funny. Huh? And, and I saw the bad stuff, went to business school, and I learned about subsidies. And, you know, it's, it, it sucks being back home. I was in a lower-income neighborhood on the res north of Seattle in the ghetto. And, you know, I, I was in a mass shooting. And my friend, I, was the, I was a survivor. My friends and family got shot in the head. And, and um, they only had, a, they, they have subsidies, $34 billion. They have trillions of dollars of subsidies in the world that goes towards the oil and gas industry, our coal, our mining, our glyphosate. Trillions of dollars worldwide, but they can't even afford to take care of these kids who went through trauma and PTSD and they end up killing each other. Gang violence went up, suicide went up, overdoses went up. My community, the average age of life expectancy was 40. In Canada, it's 82. In the United States, it's 79. Mine went to 40 because the young were bringing it down so much. It happened every month. I, I pick and choose funerals. You know, and so I got mad because of the subsidies. You know, and then, and then the PTSD, you know, can't sleep. Sometimes I don't sleep for two days because I can't. You know, and, 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 th and then I have my people on the downtown east side. So, so why I'm here is more than just the environment, right? I'm at, I'm at the intersection of, 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 of what colonization did to our people. I'm at the intersection. How are we going to educate the youth? How are we going to implement our teachings into the education system around us, right? And, and so that's why, that's part of the reason I'm here. And, and you know what? I'm able to get through this, and I'm happy. My grandma got mentally, physically, spiritually, sexually abused in residential school. And she said, I'm happy. She said, I'm happy. You know, I see the, what she does in the longhouse. I see the tears go. You know, I, I know what it's like to see your friends like that, the people you love, the land I love. I was born into this world with my land dead. I'm the first generation can't live off my land, seeing my people die. But the youth are worth it. You know, I have a... Uh, I'm really shy. People don't people don't think that, but I, I'm. This is why. <laughs> this is why I'm not shy. The elder, you know, they say if this temporary body can help make a future for tomorrow, I'll gladly give it, and that's where the hope is. And um, hopefully we're gonna. That's why I'm here. They can't speak up for themselves. Those little those little ones right here. They can barely talk. They can barely talk right now. But I hold them by the water, and we sing to them in the belly. We sing to them in the belly. We sing songs in the belly. While the babies are in the belly, we sing songs, and we have the Father touch the belly. And we sing the songs. And then when the baby comes into this world, we sing the songs. And then when they get older, they get their own song sometimes, if they behave. And, uh, <laughs> and, and you know, we teach them. You know, sometimes we have to. And, and, and they walk us through the bush. They walk us through the bush, and they teach us about They touch the moss, they say. You touch the moss and you sit there and you connect to it. You touch the moss, and then you touch the cedar, and then you go touch the water. Then you go dunk yourself in the water, and then you tell yourself where you're from. And then, and then so they say, know where you come from and educate yourself and retain. And then, and then we also have to be kind of successful in this world too. And they say, uh, read ten pages, learn about the Western world and 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 their policies, you know. And hopefully I can get into this later. I'm going to talk about the education system and how where it came from. Um, well, well, it made to make the education, Western education was simply made to make sure that you guys are good workers, that you listen to your managers, that you listen to the industrial people. At the time of the Industrial Revolution, they are making sure that you can obey. And our education system is not that. It was, it was born in the longhouse. You know, it's, it's the elders. Uh, you know, I went the, the first day of uh, elementary school is traumatizing. I was around people who don't love me, who, who are making me the same. Making you the same to obey, to obey, to be a good line worker. Everybody works and learns the same because you're a line worker. We're, 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 we're creating things. We're not no longer in the homes. It was traumatizing. 
And so hopefully I'll be able to get in t into that and into the solutions, um, implementing those solutions into our society. Our, our system of working should be in the education system and we need reform. And I want everybody to imagine here, everything you went through this weekend, imagine if you learned this growing up, <laughs> you know? That would be pretty cool, right? Being on the rafts at a young age, you know? Being the, the, the potlatch or any ceremony, that would be really cool. And so we do this from, you know, out of love. We do this out of love, you know? And um, where, where, where the hope really is, is, I'm not going to look for it. Um, it's, 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 it's in the education of our next generation. Because right now is going to be the biggest transfer of wealth in history. And I'm talking economically. If we start teaching our children right now what to do with the money, where to invest it, but most of all, you know, most of all, it's being smanoth. And what smanoth means is very important. It's, uh, it's, it's really, really important, and it's something that we bring the children to the water. We bring them to the water. We bring them to the bay, the people of the inlet. We bring them to that bay, usually where Cherry Point is in the middle, so you can see the mountains and you can see right the bay right there, or you can see the sunset. It's pretty cool. You know, we try to make it majestic. <laughs> we want them to remember. And what we tell them impacts them for the rest of their life, and it's manoth means rich but willing to share. Not just monetary value, but richness of the mind, heart, and teachings. And you heal yourself to become medicine for the people and shine a light so bright it can't be ignored. So you won't even try to heal your people, the land, the water. You'll, you, you know, you'll be, you know, you won't even try. The young will see it. The people will see it and want to emulate it. And they want to emulate it, right? They, they'll want to go up and dance. And so, yeah. Also, you know, the food was good here. Thank you. I just want to give each of you the opportunity for some closing comments. Closing for this panel. Don't worry, we're not closing. <laughs> but for this panel, uh, Shay, do you have any closing words? <coughs> Anything you'd like to leave us with a message? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I guess I'd, I'd really like to say that I'm just thankful that I was asked to be on this panel. Um, and for the generosity of the Get em Done the last three and a half years of living on their territory and for everything I've been able to learn. Um, yeah, like I, like I said, I feel like this generation of youth are, are so ready for radical action in a way that I think is, is really important and necessary for where we are at in the climate crisis. I think that, um, direct action is like a really strong route. And I think that there's a lot of avenues that need to be taken um, given the place that we are within the society. I think there's a lot of pressure that needs to be put financially on industry, on the government, a lot of political pressure that needs to be put on both. Um, and yeah. then I think that there's a lot of grassroots pressure that needs to continue to happen. Um, I think that Wet'suwet'en territory has been such a beautiful place for that within this movement over the last decade. Um, but there's a lot of other places popping up too, like um, 1492 Landback Lane, Ferry Creek. There's a lot of different um, front lines that I feel like have been really taking matters into their own hands um, in a way that I think is just so incredible. Um, that inspires other places to do the same. Um, there's also the Tiny House Warriors um, down south. And um, I think that abolition movement is really tied into this as well, the way that um, the cops are treating our people, um, they're coming into our territory, they're denying our charter rights um, as indigenous people, um, they're removing Wet'suwet'en women from Wet'suwet'en territory um, and our allies, and I think that it's like really egregious that that's happening, and internationally we need to be calling attention to that. Um, you know, there's a lot of other radical actions that are happening, um, People are targeting CEOs of banks like RBC um, in a way that they deserve to be targeted. Um, someone really high up in RBC had a car torched in Montreal earlier this year. Um, I don't see that as violence. I see that as what is necessary um, in fighting the climate crisis. What is violence is ripping indigenous women off indigenous territory. 
Um, what is violent is being pepper sprayed in my own driveway, um, being transported off my land to five different jail cells over four days, and then being put into the colonial court system for years and years. Um, just this fall will be the start of our trials for the coyote camp arrests. And by the end of it, it'll be over two years since those arrests happen. Um, in March, I'll have trial for being pepper sprayed last summer on the Yinta um, for going to check on Slato's family. So in a place where I was living when I was living on the territory. So, you know, there's all these different forms of violence. The drilling underneath the Wadzinkwa, that's violence. That's violence to our people, to our territory, um, to all the salmon, for everyone downstream. And so I think it's really important to recognize the way that media and the state is trying to draw divides even deeper within our communities, um, within the Umshua, the white people that live in our communities that are on our side. Um, <clears throat> this year in particular, there's been a lot of targeting of anarchists within Gixan and Wet'suwet'en territory um, in a way that's trying to um, draw a divide between them that I think is really important to name. Um, I think that anarchism and the people that uphold that political belief um, and indigenous people, grassroots frontline people have a lot in common um, and this partnership or supporting one another is a really big threat to the Canadian state because the basis of indigenous governance and upholding our sovereignty um, is directly against the power of the Canadian state and that is already scary for them and then to bring in partnership with outside groups, with Umshua, I think is really threatening. And it's in a position that in the past with our elders that have been fighting for this, they haven't had the support of the Umshua for a long time. And so now we're in these positions where we have these allies, we have all these people in this room that are willing to put in the work, to put in the money, um, to put in the time to support indigenous people. And I think that's something that we need to keep building. We need to keep strengthening over time. Um, there's also this narrative of the outside agitator that's been being used the last like six months specifically here. Um, but this, this narrative isn't a new narrative. It dates back to the beginning of colonial or colo colonialism in North America and slavery in the US. Um, this, this narrative of the out outside agitator specifically is used to umber undermine the real concerns of marginalized people. And so I think I just want to draw attention to those things um, and really recognize that we're stronger together. Unity, the point of this gathering, is coming together and recognizing that we all have strength with one another. We're stronger together when we fight these fights and indigenous youth um, are here for that, you know? I can see it in many ways um, during the legislature occupation and shut down Canada in 2020, I heard a lot of people um, say the words that reconciliation is dead. And I remember a lot of indigenous youth reflecting on that and thinking about, I don't know how Canada is gonna bounce back from indigenous youth all over the country saying that reconciliation is dead, that all these pacifist things that they've been doing in the past, all this money they throw at us, it won't work anymore. Um, you know, we're, we're young indigenous people and we care about our territory. Um, like Cedar said, there's people that don't have territory they can live off anymore. We're so, so blessed as Gixan and Wet'suwet'en people to have this pristine river that still has salmon in it. And at the headwaters, we can still drink from it. We had our allies, the Haudenosaunee from out east come and they, they can't eat the salmon from the river and they can't drink the water, they can barely swim in it. And so recognizing we're still in this place that's so beautiful and so pristine and we still have animals to hunt and salmon to eat, it's something that we really have to fight for. And when other people are fighting for the same thing, we have to stand in solidarity. And that, that doesn't just look like hanging banners or having marches, it looks like reoccupying our own territory. Um, and encouraging other people to do it and support it when they do. You know, the Gixan, Colin and Denzel from the Gitluchum Hetwith, they set up a blockade on their territory to stop logging. And it's been amazing to see their family doing that work um, and seeing the support that the community is giving them as well. 
And then we see places out east um, fighting different battles that are that are all connected because it's all under the fight of colonialism. Um, out in Winnipeg, I just had a chance to stop in at the Brady Landfill blockade completely by accident. I was just driving past it and got to stop in. But these are people that are fighting for their government to just search landfills for their missing and murdered indigenous women that they know are in there. And the government isn't willing to give the money for it. And so I think that it's all, it's all so connected, the fight against poverty, the war on drugs and homelessness and us fighting for our territory, having a chance to go to the territory and heal is so integral to indigenous young people. You know, I, I was only 20 years old when I first went to camp and I've healed so much in that time. I've learned so much by being on the territory and I've had to face a lot of police harassment and I've faced intense burnout um, and mental health struggles, but it's still something that I would choose every time because I know I'm fighting for my future. I know I'm fighting for the future of my brother's children, for Slato's children, for all the children that I love in my life. I, I want them to be able to go there. I want them to put their feet in what's in bin and to drink the water from there. And, you know, I've heard Frida Houston Halcott talk about not wanting to describe what salmon tastes like to her grandchildren, you know? being able to, for them to know. And, and it's similar on Wet'suwet'en territory, the caribou migration has almost completely died out on the Yinta because of industry, because of Alcan, and they don't get to know the taste of caribou anymore. And I think that, you know, all of, all of the things that I've had to endure have been worth it um, in order to protect this territory, and I'll, I'll continue to do it. and. I really, really encourage any indigenous youth that are interested in doing stuff like this to just, you know, get involved, learn things about your culture, um, come to camp, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Shailene. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left, but I'd like to hear from Violet. Any closing words? Um, I'm just so grateful to be here. Uh, Throughout my years, growing up on the land was a, a very normal thing for me. Um, we were so far away and isolated, me and my family, my, my, 13, or my 12 siblings and my mom and dad. Um, and although technically we were below the poverty line, it never ever felt that way. Never did it feel that way. Uh, we went hunting, we went fishing, we went berry picking, and that was normal for me. Um, until I was a teenager and, you, you know, life, life comes into play. You want to go out and learn new things and all these things. And I left to go learn artwork. And I, artwork is my passion. That's where my heart is. But the more I got into my artwork, um, the deeper rooted I felt. I felt more confident. Um, and I want to share that with other youth. I want to share that with my friends and I want to share that with my nieces and nephews and I want my mom and dad to know that when they're gone from this world that we have the heart to keep going. And so I'm here to listen and learn from you guys. You guys are the ones who've been fighting. You guys are the ones who've gone through and experienced stuff um, that I would like to take home and share with my people. So thank you. Imagine. Thank you for having me here, having me on this panel, learning from your strength, learning from your ways of how you have tackled all the different problems that have come your way, mentally, physically, emotionally. And I hope we can continue to build on our allyship, continue to support, to give, to give back to each other, to give back to the community, to give back to the earth, to give back to Mother Earth that we all come from. Thank you. Cedar. <coughs> um, yeah, first, uh, 
Thanks, Kai, for bringing up the Yaki stuff. Yeah, that really, I really appreciate it. And it made me think about that. Those are my people, my friends and family. I, I hear about it. I, I'm going down back down there January for a festival. A little celebration, ceremony festival, you know. We all come together, just have fun. And um, y y yeah, yeah, you know, just, just to put it out there, just um, I really think there's strength and unity across the borders, right? From Mexico all the way up here, we're all, we're all going through the same thing. And my best friend, you know, came to Canada. Um, you know, she was fighting mining companies. Guess where they're from? Guess where they're based from? Canada. Vancouver. And so her and her family ran away, right? Because they're killing people, right? And, and, you know, I know I have family close to me have been killed by industry or fighting the military or, and that's normal. And um, you just, uh, they, they, you know, they say it's for the youngins. You know, that's, that's the only thing you put in your head. It's okay to move forward. And uh, it, it does suck, right? And, um, but, but yeah, you know, I really believe in bringing the condor and the eagle together will really, really create a new future. You know, the, the prophecies say that the world are gonna start to look towards native people, right? For, for, for the movement going forward, for leadership. And um, yeah, I just wanted to, to end off with, yeah, with the education system. We're gonna continue fighting because of the education system. They're gonna keep on producing these workers, right, that um, will invest their time into the economic growth of the current world today, which is usually based from resource extraction. And with that comes oppression and genocide, either it be on the salmon or humans or, or, or the natural environment. And um, so yeah, we, we really need to, um, I, I really believe it'd be awesome if we implement our system on our territories, if we implement, oops, if we start to implement our system of working, education, economy, native law, Big one right there, big facts, big ones. How we look at the world, how we look at others, and how we look at ourselves. And we need to implement all this into the, what do we do? But look, it'd, it'd be cool, I can, see, I can see a bright future if we start to implement all of this into our education system. To raise our children from a young age because as we know, you know, we've all been in a relationship where we love somebody six months and they're still, uh, and, uh, still not nice. And, and, um, you know, but you give a child one moment filled with love, you change their life forever. And so anybody out there who wants to talk to me about um, education, let me know. I, I work with, I've worked with many different universities, uh, elementary school, high schools, to talk about our education system, about our law, you know, teach the children on what land they're on. So if anybody out there wants to talk about ed education, let me know. And I also work with foster, uh, foster children. You know, um, the from many nations are there, right? And and um, their their parents are usually not native, and so they come in and uh, we take care of them, right? We take care of them, and so we do programming with them. So if anybody out there, um, I, I I do I, I do the environmental stuff and education, ch children work and stuff. And so if anybody out there wants to talk about that intersection, I'm I'm here and I'd love to talk because. I'm sure with the many other people here, this is, is kind of healing too. You know, maybe we're down bad, I'll tell you that. But we, we, we do this work and, and we start to get healed. You know, brings us to the land and I'm and, um, starting to do food sovereignty and, you know, I'm just being a good, in, I'm just being a good native, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, why not? Ta uh, I'm scared of my grandma, so I got to. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's all these stories. I think we're stronger, you know, by, by ourselves, we're strong people. I really believe by yourselves we're stronger people, but I'm here and I believe together we're stronger. We're very strong people, you know, and I believe together we're even stronger though, you know. Um, so yeah, I'd like to end with that and say haichka, uh, you know, haichka in. And um, I'm really appreciative for the Snowaya, the teachings of the land here, and it feels real good, you know, it feels real, real good. And so, haichka, uh, um, thank you. <laughs>